the panel, as you know, at least I assume you know since you are in the room and there's a sign outside, is the economics panel. And in the panel, we're going to look at two of the major issues that have major economic components uh, facing China today. The first is the basic question of will China continue to grow rapidly? or will it uh, slow down and possibly even sink into something like secular stagnation and, and get caught in the middle income trap? Uh, and the other big issue is, of course, whether if it does continue to grow at a fairly rapid pace, uh, will, uh, will that, what will be the impact of that, not only on the environment in China, but of course on the global issue of climate change? And then, there are many, many issues in this whole question of growth, but one of the most, one of the fundamental ones in terms of whether China can keep on going and on what, with what quality of environment it'll keep going is the question of whether it can really not just adapt uh, existing technology with minor variations to their s current situation, but whether they can become genuine in innovators on the frontier. And for that purpose, uh, for to cover those topics, we have three uh, very distinguished speakers. The first uh, who will speak is uh, Richard Cooper. Uh, Dick is uh, the, uh, however you pronounce it, the Moritz, Moritz Bose Professor of International Trade. Is that close enough? Dutch. Dutch. Oh, it's, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, 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 Dick is, is known as one is a very prominent inter expert on international finance and trade, uh, in, not just with China, but many years ago, he well he's been interested in China for a long time, and in recent years he has gotten more heavily involved with it, uh, and he in fact uh, teaches a course on the Chinese economy at Harvard today. His background, in addition to being at Harvard, he was a provost at Yale, he was under Secretary of State for Economic Affairs uh, in, what, the Carter administration and, and various other government posts. The second speaker will be uh, Professor Dale Jorgensen, who is the thing I have to, I never can remember is the name of these chairs. Samuel W. Morris University professor. Dale is one of the internationally renowned uh, theorists and econometricians, but he, today he's, he's not going to talk to us about economic theory and ec econometrics. He's going to talk to us about issues such as global warming. Dale, uh, together with Mike McElroy, was, has been involved in, from the beginning in the China project that Mike uh, led in, in its, well, still leads, uh, but in a different form now with the Global Institute. And, and Dale and Mike are uh, leading this new effort with the Global Institute, uh, which is also on the Chinese environment. And he will be talking about some of the economic issues, uh, particularly the issues of such issues as pricing of carbon, uh, and I guess cap and trade and things of that sort uh, uh, in, in the talk here. And then finally, uh, we have Ed Steinfeld, um, as somebody pointed out to me, which I, I knew since I was on his thesis committee. Ed is not an economist, he's a, but he's a political economist. Uh, and uh, he has uh, been a professor of political science at MIT and then uh, was lured to Brown, I guess, to, among other things, to build a China program. But he's, his, for, his position is uh, the director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown as well as a professor of political science. Uh, and while he's not an economist, he actually knows a great deal about, about economics. Uh, and he has gotten inside the enterprises of China and, and gotten a real fundamental understanding. And his talk today is going to be about uh, technology. The specific title is China, a Global Technology in Innovator. Uh, years and years ago when he was starting out on his thesis, he, uh, he came to me and described what he had in mind and it involved getting inside the steel industry of China and, and actually getting to know how decisions were made and the politics of it all and so on. 
And I thought as he was going on and on about what, the, what he really hoped to do, well, he's young, he can give it a try, he'll fail, and then he can go try to do something else. And next time I saw him in Beijing, he was, I think, they, I think the, the Capital Iron is still giving you an office. Yeah, more or less. Uh, they, you know, they were inviting them to their their conferences. Uh, he was talking to everybody, uh, and he wrote a great book out of it. And he's written uh, a major book, uh, at least one major book since, probably more. Uh, anyway, we we have three distinguished speakers, and we're going. They're going. We're going to go in that order. I'm going to shut up for the uh, until after they're finished. At which point, uh, my job will be to call on you to ask questions or make comments or whatever. So let's get started. Professor Cooper. <clears throat> I'm going to start I, on a biographical note. I first went to China in 1979. I was then a State Department official and we uh, were engaged in normalization between uh, the U.S. and China. I was part of that uh, process. But it means that I saw with my own eyes what China, Beijing, and a few other cities were like in 1979 with its tens of thousands of bicycles, no private cars, uh, every once in a while a Soviet limousine uh, with uh, curtains down and high officials uh, in it, and uh, no buildings higher than six floor walk-ups in Beijing. John Fairbanks first visited China about 45, 46 years earlier in the 1930s, and while um, there had been a major political change since his, his visit in the 1930s, my guess is that China to him did not look much different than it did to me in 1979 in terms of its overall uh, impression. Uh, we have seen since that time an extraordinary rate of growth in China, uh, 35 years of uh, unparalleled uh, growth, and it has been fantastic in the literal sense of the term. If you had written down in 1979 or 1980 what China would be like today in 2016, John Fairbanks would have said that's out of the question, all Chinese would have said that's out of the question, and most foreign observers would have said that's out of, the, out of the question. But here we are in 1916, we, we, 2016. <laughs> we, 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 know, we know what China's like to now. It's just been an extraordinary uh, uh, episode of economic growth, and it's been the biggest poverty reduction program in the history of mankind. Uh, depending on how you count poverty exactly, uh, more than 500 billion people have moved out of poverty over this 35-year period, uh, which means the first time they've had some discretionary income, they've had choices they've had to make and uh, for themselves, but especially for their child and the future of their child. So this, uh, from a human point of view, not just from a Chinese point of view, from a human point of view, this has been an extraordinary uh, period. Now what I want to do is uh, go through briefly um, the reasons for this Chinese growth. And unfortunately, I have seven of them. And uh, that's a problem for a lecture where you should, normally should have uh, three or most four reasons, but I have seven of them. I'll go through uh, recently, uh, quickly, uh, my seven reasons for uh, this extraordinary rate of Chinese growth. And then I want to close by saying that six of them in the future are closing down. Not literally closing, there's still some room in some of them, a little bit here and there, but basically the history of the past 35 years cannot be repeated, not only in the next 35 years, but even in the next 10 or 15 
years uh, because six of the seven reasons for rapid growth are uh, essentially, in some cases, actually reversing and in other cases, slowing down enormously. So what are my uh, seven reasons for Chinese growth? The first is, of course, the Deng Xiaoping's reforms the change in the way that resources get allocated in any modern economy, even an economy which is at, at the low income of 1980 in um, China. Uh, it had adopted from the Soviet Union the central planning system. It is impossible to run a modern economy with the Soviet system, simply impossible, even with our much greater computer power that we have today. A typical American supermarket has 50,000 different items. That's, that's a retail, retail, 50,000 different items. And uh, multiply that by all of the intermediate products, you're talking about millions of individual specified items in, uh, produced in uh, manufacturing or uh, for uh, consumption. And uh, it's just impossible to run economy that way. So the big change that took place was to use the price system to allocate resources uh, following uh, uh, Jiang Xiaoping's uh, visit to Japan, uh, to Singapore, and to the United States, and his extensive reading. Uh, and the system, the system was not working, had to be changed. Big output uh, improvement from that change. It's been gradual and it had been uneven over the 35 years, and it still has some way to go. China's not. It's largely a market economy, but not a completely a market economy. But basically, that uh, particular uh, source of growth has been largely, not completely, largely exhausted. Second reason, the Ch overseas Chinese. China uh, excluded itself. It was part of Mao's philosophy. Uh, once he broke up with the Soviet Union, uh, excluded itself from the world economy. And uh, once the opening up occurred, Chinese didn't know how to deal, mainland Chinese didn't know how to deal with foreigners. Uh, how do you develop markets? How do you advertise? How do you uh, negotiate uh, contracts and so forth? And I think a, uh, um, a very strong contributor to Chinese growth was the overseas Chinese, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, and of course in other countries, re resident in other countries, who could bridge the gap between the rest of the world and mainland China and figure out how to essentially deal with the rest of the world with the advantages that China uh, con conventionally had. Um, uh, over time, ch overseas Chinese have not gone away, but as a source of growth, that has gone away. Mainlanders now know how to deal. They have had several decades of dealing with foreigners. They know how to deal with foreigners. And uh, uh, so as a source of growth, this, uh, this um, uh, source disappears. Third, uh, what demographers called the demographic dividend. The, uh, Chinese, uh, working age Chinese, conventionally age 15 to 64, uh, increased by eight percentage points. Eight percentage points of top population between 1980 and two years ago. Uh, an extraordinary rate of increase. So the Chinese labor force uh, could grow much more rapidly than Chinese population growed. That came to reach its end about three, year, three years ago. It's on a gently declining plateau, and it, then it goes into a steep plateau as we enter the next decade. So this particular source of growth not only goes away, but it actually goes into reserve, re reverse. Fourth, um, moving people out of agriculture. China in 1980 had 70% of its labor force in agriculture. 
fundamentally development is moving people out of agriculture into more productive activities, manufacturing or service activities. Uh, China today has less than 30% of its labor force in agriculture. 40% of points of a, of a growing labor force was re reallocated out of agriculture and uh, into uh, non-agricultural activities. That w will continue. In uh, rich countries, uh, the agricultural labor force is less than 10% of GDP uh, of the labor force. Uh, in the US, it's actually under 2%. Uh, so that will continue. But most of the mileage has already been enjoyed. Uh, the average age of people in agriculture in China has gone way up. And the people who are most energetic, most mobile, have already moved. So that source will continue, but at a much slower rate. What am I? Five. Uh, rate of investment. Uh, extraordinary high in rate of China, and, uh, um, and uh, it's a uh, objective of the uh, national government to rebalance the economy away from the rate of investment and uh, declining rate of investment will by itself reduce growth rates. Moreover, rates of return on investment stayed remarkably high for the first two decades of this growth period, but during the last decade they de de declined sharply, and in particular in the SOE sector, they declined sharply. So for two reasons, one, a ratio of investment to GDP is going to decline, and the rate of return on investment has declined. And on both counts, uh, investment's going to contribute less to GDP than in the past. Sixth, exports. China was a small economy from the perspective of the rest of the world in 1980. Uh, it's now the world's biggest economy in terms of exports. Uh, what a small country can do, a big country cannot do. <laughs> China grew its exports at 17% a year uh, cumulatively from 1980 to 2010. Uh, now uh, China cannot grow substantially more, I would say not more at all, and than the growth of the world economy, which in dollar terms would be five or six percent a, uh, a year. So you have a tremendous decline, which China's already seen, uh, in um, the rate of growth of exports, and, um, and that is going to continue. If China doesn't correct it, the rest of the world will correct it, because uh, China is the object of most of the I, I shouldn't say most, but the majority of the anti-dumping cases uh, uh, around the world. My seventh factor uh, will not decline in the future. It's education. China made a strategic decision back in the 1950s to educate the peasantry. It was a profound decision, and it uh, had its payoff in, with the reforms of Deng Xiaoping in the uh, late 70s uh, because uh, people were not only technically literate, not very literate, but technically literate, but they had the uh, habit of going to school every day, the discipline of obeying the teachers and so forth, just the kinds of habits that's exactly right for the manufacturing workplace. And um, uh, the contrast there is India, but that's a different subject. Um, and um, uh, that uh, has been accomplished, but China has done an extraordinary job of extending first secondary education and now higher education to more and more of the labor force. When I first went to China, 2% of 19-year-olds went to university. Now, on a figure that's a few years old, it's 27%. My guess is up closer to 30% today. That's an extraordinary change. So I think the educational system has kept up with uh, Chinese growth. Uh, but uh, leaving that to one side, uh, my main point, and I'll uh, uh, conclude by just saying that the six factors, other than education, are all going to 
either greatly decline or actually go into reverse. And uh, the notion that China can sustain 7%, six and a half rounded up uh, for the next decade or two, I think is just uh, uh, pie in the sky. Uh, and uh, that China's growth rate will come down, come down, I don't know how far it will come down, but certainly by a decade from now, uh, below, well below 5%. Still growing more rapidly than the rest of the world, if they're successful, but uh, much less rapidly to down. And the bottom line I want to leave you with is this does not signal a failure of Chinese policy. These are fundamental factors and every time the growth rates come down you can see the black headlines around the world in the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere. Chinese growth falters, and so did. but the point is uh, these are fundamental factors. I'm not saying the Chinese government won't make any mistakes, it may make some, but even if it uh, pursues economic policy skillfully and subtly, uh, the growth rate is going to come down and uh, to repeat, uh, should not be interpreted either by Chinese or by foreigners as a failure of policy. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm a professor of economics as well as a university professor at Harvard, and I'm very pleased that uh, Dwight and the Fairbank Center gave me this opportunity to uh, discuss the Chinese economy uh, on the occasion of the 60th anniversary celebration. Uh, even though I'm not a China specialist, uh, it obviously hasn't escaped my attention <laughs> that uh, 60 has a special role uh, as a uh, cycle in the uh, Chinese calendar. So uh, this is a very appropriate occasion. I'm uh, very pleased to uh, join you on this occasion. So you've heard from Dick Cooper uh, about the uh, growth of the Chinese economy. And in a way, this is the big ticket item uh, in terms of uh, economics. And uh, very appropriate that you should uh, hear that as the um, starting point for our discussion of topics related to the Chinese economy. What I want to talk about is much more limited in scope. But I'm going to argue, especially given the relatively limited prospects for Chinese uh, growth uh, at uh, double-digit rates in the uh, future, uh, that uh, this is in fact a, a central issue and it's something that uh, deserves uh, the attention that we're giving it here in this symposium. My topic is the role of carbon prices in Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, future. So uh, it turns out that uh, this is a very popular topic among uh, people who work on China. Seems a little bit esoteric and narrow, but uh, I think you can begin to see why this is uh, so central. But first of all, a few facts. Uh, I think that uh, Dick mentioned China's outstanding uh, economic accomplishments. Uh, and uh, one way of summarizing this uh, is in terms of the World Bank's comparison of different economies. And the most recent of these, published uh, just a couple of years ago, found that China now has the world's largest economy measured in economic terms. That's not the way that it was reported in the Wall Street Journal or even The Economist, uh, but uh, in fact, that is something that economists, I think, can uh, easily appreciate. Uh, the United States, for a whole century, uh, was the world's largest economy and is now, according to the uh, World Bank, uh, only number two. Well, that's the uh, first point. China has a very large accomplish, uh, accomplishment in terms of uh, eliminating poverty, but in the process of uh, very, very rapid growth for an extended period of time, China has achieved this uh, quite remarkable distinction of having now the world's largest economy, faced by the headwinds that you've heard that uh, Dick Cooper has uh, described. Now we come to the uh, main point that I'm going to uh, use as a point of departure. China also turns out to be the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases. Gosh, that sounds a little technical, right? So exactly what does that mean? Well, 
Greenhouse gases are gases in the atmosphere which are responsible for global warming. And this is something that is uh, discussed a lot. In China's case, a very large portion of the greenhouse gases emitted by China, the world's number one emitter of greenhouse gases, are the result of coal combustion, burning coal, and uh, not always in circumstances that uh, lead to uh, benign environmental outcomes. So coal combustion releases large amounts of the most important single greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, through the oxida oxidation, obviously, of the uh, carbon in uh, coal. And uh, there is, in fact, uh, the um, fact of uh, the greenhouse uh, warming that results from the fact that if we have greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, solar radiation causes them to release heat, and that causes global warming. So this is obviously the subject of great concern. Coal combustion, however, is also associated with more conventional pollution, and in particular uh, with the emission of particulates. Again, a technical term, so let me be sure that everybody uh, is uh, on the same page here. Particulate matter consists of tiny particles that lodge in your lungs and cause disease. And this is, in fact, the result of the combustion of coal. But particles of various sizes, of course, are emitted uh, as uh, part of smoke. But uh, these uh, particulars, especially small ones, uh, are particularly uh, noxious. Well, at any rate, so there is a link between atmospheric emissions of greenhouse gases and the process that generates air pollution. And air pollution is something that is the topic not only of technical discussion about China, but also popular discussion. For example, uh, you may have read in last weekend's China Daily, especially members of the audience who are from Boston, you get the China Daily with the Boston Globe, right? So every week you have a weekly weekend edition. And uh, an article uh, uh, that appeared uh, this week called China Seeing a Clear Day. The idea being that oftentimes you can't see a clear day in uh, China. Actually a pretty sophisticated article by Paul Wolitzkin who is an expert in this area. And he focused a lot of attention on the work of the Harvard China Project. The Harvard China Project. Well, that's what I'd like to discuss. And so uh, you'll find a link to uh, the China Daily article, give you a uh, popular rendition, kind of at the level of the Wall Street Journal. This is uh, pretty sophisticated. And uh, does have a uh, popular uh, conclusion, which is the link between uh, atmospheric emissions of um, uh, greenhouse gases on the one hand and air pollution on the other. That's the uh, key link uh, for which he draws on the Harvard China Project. The Harvard China Project began about two decades ago, been around for a while, and uh, it was uh, initiated by Mike McElroy, who is here with us today, and a uh, group of uh, us joined forces with him, including uh, Dwight Perkins. One of the first outputs of this work was a modeling framework that I uh, put together with Dwight and uh, uh, Mun Ho and uh, other collaborators, and this became the starting point for our discussion of changes in the Chinese economy in response to economic policy. Well, uh, to make a long story short, uh, this is something that has become uh, a major subject uh, in Harvard research, and so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, Harvard China Project that was the subject of this China Daily um, piece uh, only this last weekend. First of all, let's uh, have some other facts, this time political facts that, uh, again, I think you're probably aware of. For example, uh, there was a U.S. bilateral agreement with China that was announced by the two presidents, Barack Obama and Xi Jinping, in November of 2014. That's almost uh, two years ago. And they agreed to coordinate their efforts toward green, low-carbon, and climate-resilient economies. 
So this is something that set forth climate actions that would be undertaken by both countries. So far as China is concerned, the idea was that China would cap its emissions at a peak that would be attained in 2030, which is not so long from now, about 15 years. So carbon emissions have been steadily increasing. China is now number one in terms of emissions of greenhouse gases. But the important point is that these will reach a plateau and then level off uh, by the year 2030. So there will also be, of course, uh, less reliance on fossil fuels like uh, ch uh, coal, uh, but also oil and natural gas. And the goal is to have the share of non-fossil fuels in the Chinese energy system be about 20%, again, by uh, 2030. This is part of China's contribution to the bilateral agreement. That's the idea. I'm not going to go into detail just from lack of time. Uh, if you want uh, more information about this, I'll be happy to discuss it. Uh, I won't talk about the details of the U.S. commitment that was part of this international announcement. Now we come to the Harvard China project. The Harvard China Project recently received a major grant, as Dwight told you, from the Harvard Global Institute to support a program called China 2030-2050. Why 2030-2050? Needless to say, since we have a close association between environmental issues in China, climate, but also conventional air pollution, and emissions of coal uh, combustion, we need to think about how the energy system works. And the energy system is something that involves very large facilities integrated across very extensive geographical areas and requires extensive time. Pretty much the uh, existing system uh, in 2030 is something that is either under construction now or has recently been completed. And so it's only beginning at that time that we'll begin to have a couple decades during which policies can have an impact on the environmental emissions that I've been describing in China. So that's the uh, basic uh, program then. And the focus of the Harvard Global Institute, as announced by President Drew Faust of Harvard is on China, the initial uh, focus geographically of the Global Institute will be precisely on uh, China, which we're here to uh, discuss. Well, let's proceed then with uh, China's own view of its environmental uh, policy problems. What happens after uh, 2030? In June of 2015, China unilaterally announced its intended nationally determined contribution, jaw-breaking phrase, right? To the Conference of the Parties 21, COP 21, in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Telescope all that into a national commitment to contribute to an international effort to limit climate change. That's the key idea. This took place in June of 2015 anticipating an agreement that would come out of a conference of the parties convened by the United Nations in Paris last December, December of 2015. The two leaders, Barack Obama and Xi Jinping, followed this Chinese statement with a joint statement about what the two countries would do together. And it largely paralleled their November uh, agreement that I alluded to a moment ago. So after the Paris meeting, after the Paris Agreement, on March 31st, the two presidents once again made a joint announcement. They said that the U.S. and China would sign, that is to say ratify, the joint agreement coming out of the Paris meeting. And earlier this week, U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon announced that the goals of Ratifying the Paris Agreement had been met. 55 countries, in fact more, accounting for more than 55% of global emissions related to climate change had agreed to ratify the Paris Agreement. And therefore, that agreement will go into force next month. So the scene here is shifting very radically. We have now arrived at the role of carbon pricing in China's future. 
What does all this have to do with carbon pricing? Just like an economist, right? Talking about pricing all the time. Well, uh, in fact, China's contribution to the Paris Agreement calls for the pricing of carbon. What? Well, let's uh, provide a little more background here. In the third plenary session, this is, you know, again, arcana here for China experts, of the 18th Central Committee meeting in November 2013, it was established that the market would have a decisive role in resource allocation and that China would undertake a program of fiscal reform, implementation of paid for resource use, by which they meant depletion of uh, resources that would be paid for, and energy conservation, which would be part of the climate program. So how is China going to do this? They're going to do it by implementing an emissions trading system. Now again, I realize that this is going to require a little bit of explanation, so let me just mention what that is. The basic idea is that you monitor the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Let's just call that carbon emissions, okay, just to simplify. And then, for each production unit in the whole economy, you have a system of permits that would have to be matched up against the emissions that actually took place. And so this idea is that there would be emissions permits that would be issued, and these would be matched up against carefully monitored emissions of these greenhouse gases. The trading component arises when a unit that is able to meet its requirements without using all of its permits is allowed to sell the permits to a unit that needs additional permits in order to meet the requirements. So the basic idea then of establishing the price in carbon is to have a system of emissions trading based on permits. That's the idea. Now you might say, well this sounds pretty far-fetched, even if you buy all this stuff about the uh, 13th uh, Committee and so on. But in fact, China already has in place seven pilot projects, including one that covers the whole city and province of Beijing. So the idea is that this system of seven pilot projects will be expanded into a national system that will cover something like half of all the emissions that take place in China. To be precise, it will cover eight industrial sectors with 18 major industrial subsectors. But I want to emphasize, this doesn't cover the whole economy. It covers big things like generating electricity, like producing steel, involving coal combustion, for example. But it covers less than 50% of the Chinese economy. Well, we arrive then at the challenge which is faced by the Harvard China Project. Last May in Beijing, the Harvard China Project organized a conference devoting, devoted to carbon pricing. And at that uh, conference, uh, we presented a paper uh, that had been sponsored by the Harvard Global Institute on resource taxes, carbon taxes, and fiscal reform. And we presented an interdisciplinary analysis of what the consequences of carbon pricing would be in this framework. By that interdisciplinary terminology, I mean economics, obviously, but also environmental engineering, atmospheric sciences, and finally health policy. All four of these were integrated into our analysis, so we refer to that as an integrated assessment. So what is the role of carbon taxes in China's future policy? It is to fill the gap that will not be occupied by the emissions trading system. About 50% of the emissions, 46 to be precise, will be covered by this emission trading system of the major carbon intensive production sectors of the Chinese economy. The rest of the economy would be covered under our proposal by a carbon tax, which would also be integrated with an overall system for pricing carbon. Details, of course, to be the subject of research. Well, the idea then would be that there would be a cap and trade system that would cover part of the economy, 
and a hybrid system that would fill in the gaps using a carbon tax and the two would be put together. What we found was when we convened the group of people who were experts on this subject in China is that there was a discussion of a hybrid tax and trading system already underway in China and at the highest levels in the research units that are attached to the State Council. So in fact, we were encouraged by this to proceed with the design of a hybrid system that would uh, meet this need in uh, China's uh, environmental policy. Well, let me uh, simply conclude. Carbon prices in China are going to play a central role in dealing with one of the key issues in China's economic policy going forward, namely environmental policy. And it will cover both aspects of environmental policy, namely China's international contribution to the international effort worldwide uh, under the auspices of the United Nations for controlling global warming. But from the Chinese domestic point of view, it will cover domestic air pollution requirements in China. It will make a vital contribution to dealing with the, fa the uh, clear day issue uh, that we all face uh, when we travel to uh, China. So this will be a very, very important uh, issue, this uh, pricing of carbon. The Chinese are committed to this idea of the pricing of carbon. This is not an incidental feature. It is something that is deeply embedded in the political system and will be embedded in institutions, an emissions trading system that will be implemented next year and for which there are already the seven pi uh, pilot projects that I alluded to. Well, this is going to enable China to achieve numerous environmental goals. And these will continue, whatever the headwinds that the Chinese economy encounters in terms of continued economic growth. So in order to deal with these vital environmental uh, problems, uh, pricing of carbon turns out to be a, a central issue. Furthermore, carbon pricing is going to be a central issue in the Harvard China project going forward through the Harvard Global Institute. So you could view this activity on the part of the Harvard Global Institute as a direct continuation of the effort that was established by John King Fairbank 60 years ago. What exactly was he trying to achieve? He was trying to achieve a link between Harvard and China that would promote the joint interests of the United States and this soon to be rapidly growing uh, economy that Dick Cooper has uh, described for you. So I'm sure that the accomplishments of the Fairbank Center, which we're going to be discussing here at this conference, will serve as an inspiration for all of us, in particular uh, to the uh, people who are going to be uh, doing this ourselves and our uh, collaborators in China as we grapple with these pressing policy issues facing China in terms of its environmental policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dwight and, and Dick and Dale. I feel um, honored and uh, mortified to be on this panel, mortified for exactly the reason that Dwight mentioned. I'm neither a macroeconomist nor a microeconomist. I'm a political scientist who's very interested in industrial processes and industrial upgrading, especially in China. And I spend a lot of time in enterprises in China. Uh, I, I did, however, many years ago pass Act 10 barely. Uh, and I learned in Act 10, I, th I think an indisputable fact, that long-term sustained economic growth has to depend, does depend, on something more than just factor accumulation. That somehow there have to be productivity increases, the kind of productivity increases we associate with knowledge and particular kinds of know-how and differentiation and technology adoption and innovation, a term that's sort of ephemeral, very hard to to pinpoint a phenomenon that's very hard to pinpoint. And let me just mention something about the difficulty of pinpointing innovation, not with respect to China, but instead with respect to Japan. Actually, I think at least some of us in the room remember in the 70s and in the early 80s when we observed Japan's 
continued rapid development and, and, and impressive performance in industry, and many people outside of Japan attributed this to government subsidies. And they attributed this development to stealing of knowledge and copying and mimicry, stuff that's not what one would associate with innovation. Then over time, observers began to see that it wasn't necessarily new products, there wasn't really new processes, the capital equipment may have been the same as elsewhere, but there was something different about the way the Japanese were producing. And that was not dismissed, but treated as something that only the Japanese could do because of a collective culture and attitudes, and not, not something that could be done elsewhere. And then thinking evolved, and we all know today that that style of organizing production we know today as lean production. And it's taught to many companies all over the world by many, many consultants. And the point there is to say that some of the kinds of know-how that economies and firms and economies develop, particularly developing economies, it's hard to pinpoint. It becomes apparent only after the fact. It may be a source of differentiation for years or even decades, but it too often fades or at least becomes uh, no longer differentiated but copyable in other economies. Uh, in the Japanese case, the other advanced industrial economies, including the US, learn to copy lean production. So uh, at least one of the points I want to make today, or one of the possibilities I want to raise, is that there's some kind of analog to lean production, some kind of analog to a unique way of producing that exists in China today or is developing in China today. I, I don't know for sure that that's the case, but I feel as if I'm observing it. And rather than provide a lot of uh, uh, data from a, a macro perspective about this phenomenon, let me go very micro and relate to you uh, what I'm seeing through the eyes of several Swiss and German firms that I work with. These are all manufacturing firms that have been around a long time. They're very technology intensive, uh, very knowledge intensive, and they're global leaders in a number of, in a number of sectors. So uh, these firms are all operating in China and are all moving aggressively to try to learn a style of manufacturing that they see as distinct and distinctive in China. And they're having a very hard time learning this and having a very hard time absorbing the, the, the practices. And I guess in in a broad sense, I would describe these practices that these firms see in China as relating to a particular approach to industrial design, a particular style of basically reverse engineering that involves simplification, it involves use of kinds of componentry that Europeans and Americans aren't using. It involves design for manufacturability that allows for rap very rapid scaling. It involves very rapid cost out from designs. And it involves a very rapid customization for a variety of different customers, many of whom are industrial customers. Rather than talk about generalities, though, let me give you an example that I hope will be telling. So this isn't an example of a consumer product, nothing sexy like an iPhone, but it is a product that for at least 25 years, uh, virtually everybody in this room has been a beneficiary of. Uh, it's something called an optical sorter. It's used in the production of foods, particularly grains, particularly rice. And it's something that until recently couldn't be found in China, couldn't be found in India, but would be found in any rice mill in, in, in Japan or the United States or Europe. So what, what does this not so sexy piece of industrial equipment do? It's uh, you know bigger than this table and uh, rice in this case pours through this machine at very high speed and the rice falls in front of a sensor, a, a camera, and that camera is linked to a bunch of signal processing software and it can identify um, abnormalities in that rice, so little stones or discolored rice, and after identifying those abnormalities, as all this rice is passing through, then there's some pneumatic ejectors, little nozzles that blow some air and can blow that little stone or discolored grain of rice out of the mix. And that's great, we don't really think about it, but for at least 25 years, we've all gone to the supermarket here and we buy high quality branded rice and we don't do something that I think many of you can remember, I can certainly remember from the 1980s, when we eat our rice, we don't worry about chomping on a little stone. And in fact, the rice all has a nice white quality. So that 
piece of equipment, which I said has been around for 25 years. It was a product made by five global companies until quite recently, a Japanese firm, a Korean firm, a UK firm, a German firm, and an American firm. It was a great market, a pretty stable market, but very high-end mills all over the advanced industrial world would buy this piece of equipment. There were huge margins for the five producers. It was a good market, a stable market, and it was a very sophisticated piece of equipment in which there was an integrated design in each of the five cases invo involving sensors and software and lots of of um, highly technical mechanics, particularly surrounding the ejectors. So a very interesting thing happened. Again, I think very typical in a lot of industries in China. A very interesting thing happened in the early 2000s in, uh, with all due respects for anybody from there, in a rather down and out city, uh, Hefei, the capital of Anhui. So in the early 2000s, a number of of agricultural equipment producers, they saw this piece of equipment because a couple of mills in China had purchased it, big state-owned mills, untouchable uh, as customers for these small agricultural equipment producers. But these producers saw that piece of equipment. And they had, interestingly, a vision for that piece of equipment that the Japanese and the Koreans and the Germans and the Americans and the Brits who are producing this never had. What these small agricultural equipment producers in Hefei saw was maybe that thing, maybe that piece of equipment could be provided to a farmer or a small scale rice producer. But how, how can you possibly do that? It's a big piece of equipment with lots of extremely sophisticated sensing and signal processing. And so what these producers did was not like what the Japanese did. They didn't set up some kind of big vertically integrated operation. They didn't um, set up a single firm to do this. They scrambled as if they had a blank piece of paper. They scrambled to fill in the blanks wherever they could find it. In the case of Hefei, where they turned to wasn't uh, Zhongkada, wasn't the China University of Science and Technology. One would think that would be the, a place to go get technology. Instead, they a series of industrial producers who had been working in state firms but had privatized small pieces of the manufacturing operation. So they, they had some manufacturing operations for capital equipment and they had some knowledge about maybe ma being able to make pneumatic ejectors, but they didn't have the software, the sensing. They turned to an R&D center for the PLA. It was an air defense R&D center that was doing work on signal processing for anti-aircraft uh, systems. Now, what a researcher in an, in an anti-aircraft R&D center should be doing mixing it up with firms and whether a researcher in a center like that should be selling some of his center's technology to a firm, well, it's not so clear that's legal in any country. And certainly, I think it's fair to say it was inappropriate in China. But there were entrepreneurs in that center just as there were entrepreneurs in the manufacturing sector as well in Hefei. And they managed through lots of transactions and lots of experimentation to come together. And it turned out in the early 2000s, not one, but several producers in Hefei got their hands on motherboards and cameras that could do the job of optical sensing for a piece of agricultural equipment. Now that's interesting, they, they had the pieces sourced from the defense sector, illegally, of course. They were producing on shop floors that had been, I don't know, illegally, but um, uh, not quite legally privatized from, from state firms, but they still had a problem. They had the pieces of the machine, but that doesn't make for a machine. So they poured engineering talent into this thing, not the kind of high-end talent that works in some upstream lab in a fancy university, this one, or MIT, or wherever. They poured in talent that we associate with product development, product developers. And those product developers disassembled existing optical sorters, and they figured out how to reassemble one, and they figured out how to do the redesign so that it could accommodate the components that they had, because they didn't have the components that the Swiss had, or the Brits had, or the Americans had. And at incredibly rapid pace, they were able to redesign this sorter. And they were able to deliver a sorter to customers that sort of worked. Those customers were willing to use it because it was given to the customers for free. The idea was you use it. Those customers had never seen an optical sorter before because they were 
fairly small scale farmers who were presented with this thing. And the companies would go to the field and figure out how to make the product work with the farmer moving the rice through the piece of equipment. What's interesting though is that kind of redesign, that kind of redefinition of a product to an entirely different market, one that the Brits and the Americans and the Germans never thought it was worth going after, that redefinition of the product happened at a time when a middle class was developing and a retail sector in China was developing. In other words, it happened just at the time, whether intentionally or not, when there were retailers who could sell a branded bag of rice and people who might be inclined to buy a bag, a, a branded bag of rice and farmers who figured, you know, it wouldn't be so bad to sell a branded bag of rice instead of taking our raw material and just giving it to a state mill. And the market for optical sorters boomed. It didn't just boom in China. It boomed in India. Those were all countries, or are all countries, that are big consumers of rice. But rice, until just a few years ago, was purchased in wet markets for the most part. And it was low quality rice. So now you have the ability of a low end producer to produce a high quality product. You have a producer, uh, 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 <clears throat> excuse me, a capital equipment producer in China who can deliver this product at very low cost. The market boomed and the market was fulfilled by the Chinese, mostly from Hefei. And the market was fulfilled in China and it was fulfilled in India and it's being fulfilled in Pakistan. And the Germans and Swiss and Americans and Japanese are wondering how? How did, they do, how did they do that redesign so quickly? How did they do the scaling so quickly? How did they do the cost up? This, as I said, it's not a sexy product. There are no subsidies coming into this. The government doesn't care about it, although now the city of Hefe is interested. But as I said, the Swiss and Germans in particular have been very keen to understand how this has been done. And they're having a hard time trying to duplicate it. I could provide some more accounts of why it's been hard for them and what they've been trying to do. But I simply want to leave you with a point, at least the first point, that there may be a kind of, not revolution, but a, a, a real change, a real kind of innovation in the way that basic manufacturing is done and it's being led by a bunch of Chinese producers. It has to do with reverse engineering, but reverse engineering is not just mimicry. It's not just stealing. It's not just aping. It involves real design, and it, particularly when it's done at very high tempo, and particularly when it's done in new markets with customers who don't know how to use the product or never use the product and have to be educated. When that comes together with a lot of other changes, like the ones I talked about in retail and changes in customer, in, in basic household consumer preferences, that makes for a lot of value creation. A lot of value creation. And again, we're seeing it today and we're seeing the eagerness of advanced industrial producers to jump into that. And we're seeing fear among advanced industrial producers that that same approach to cost out and product definition will start to move up into the high end products. And it's not just an amorphous fear, it's already happening. Let me make a second point though uh, about this kind of um, change in the way production is happening in China. One can make the argument that the, that the type of re-engineering and uh, rapid cost out and rapid scaling that I'm talking about offers a kind of competitive advantage for a very brief period of time. Because it may not take that long for everybody to figure out how to do this. If you're not sure about that, just go to Hefei. You could find 22 producers of optical sorting equipment today. And they're producing pretty much undifferentiated products, which is very problematic for their bottom line because they compete on the basis of cost and they keep cutting the price. It's also quite troubling to Swiss and Americans and Japanese and Germans because they see their previously highly differentiated, very high-end product becoming a basic commodity, a commodity piece of industrial equipment. And that gets really to the second point I want to raise about what's next. And I think what's interesting about this is what's next seems to be happening arguably in China before or at least simultaneous with the next step in other advanced industrial economies. So think about that optical sorter for a moment. That optical sorter is a piece of equipment, but it's also a sensor 
It's a data collector. Just like the, you know, we all have sensors in our pockets now. We have sensors on our computer when we Google stuff. The optical sorter is a, is a data collector. And now those kinds of sensors are all through the food supply chain and many other supply chains. The Chinese government, like the German government, frankly, and the German government's Industry 4.0 um, program and the Chinese government's China Manufacturing 2025 program, has elected to promote the spread, the, the rapid and large-scale spread of sensing and data collection and advanced data analytics and cognitive computing and cloud computing. Both of these governments are encouraging the spread of these technologies across the manufacturing sector. Where will this ultimately go? Very hard to know. We can imagine certain kinds of products that come from this sensing. So there are food security products that come from this sensing. You don't have to imagine that. That's already here and attached to things like optical sorting. You can imagine different kinds of data about um, humidity and water and energy use through the food supply chain. You don't have to imagine that. It's already here. Those products are here. They're in China and increasingly in Europe and North America. You can also imagine financial products, given that now we can sense the levels of grain, types of grain that are moving on an hourly or by minute basis through equipment. But it's not exactly clear what the products will be. Certainly the Chinese government, all the way down to the municipality, is pushing this kind of move out of traditional manufacturing, not abandoning traditional manufacturing, but coupling traditional manufacturing with far over the horizon, data intensive, virtual intensive, Internet of Things intensive type production. So I raise that really as a, a point of conclusion. It's quite striking to me. I don't know whether to celebrate this or, 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 or to rue it, but it's quite striking to me the way that, partly in Germany and certainly in China, the way manufacturing is discussed today, and particularly advanced manufacturing, particularly the kind of things we associate with Internet of Things or cloud computing or cognitive computing, the discussion is never about jobs. Or at least in China, it seems to be never about jobs. The discussion isn't about clawing something back. The discussion doesn't seem to be about defending or saving anything. The discussion seems to be about plunging forward into the future. Maybe an unknown future, but plunging forward into a future. What the jobs will be like in that future? Who knows? What people will be, what kind of training will be needed for that future? Who knows? But it's striking to me the kind of aspirational quality that exists in China and other places, including Germany too, about the promise that the future may hold. And I'll just conclude by saying that aspirational quality about the future, the feeling that somehow by moving forward, rather than being defensive, by moving forward and doing so, regardless of what a government program will be, by breaking the rules, so that thing about entrepreneurs in Hefei working with renegade entrepreneurs in a defense R&D facility, totally typical, I think as many of us would acknowledge in China. That aspirational quality, that willingness to break the rules, that willingness to plunge forward without thinking about what the risks really are, but um, capture new opportunities after plunging forward and deal with the liabilities again after the fact, plunging forward. That kind of aspirational quality, frankly, reminds me of something that Rodney Farker mentioned the, this morning. That kind of quality that we look back at, at farmers in China in the 1980s, look back at as a kind of a golden age. And I would just end by saying, I personally don't believe the golden age of politics in China um, is the present. I don't think the golden age of um, social equity and social policy in China is the present, uh, or in the US for that matter. But I do think some of that golden age aspiration and that golden age ambition to push forward into the frontiers that we're seeing in very, very traditional kinds of manufacturing in China today, that kind of golden age aspiration, apart from the politics, still exists in China and maybe is more alive and more well than ever before. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. thank you. We'll open it to questions, but first, before I'm going to take the chairman's prerogative to ask a couple of questions. First, of Dick. Uh, I agree with the, the six that are disappearing. The question is whether that seventh education uh, by itself, education is not going to sustain uh, any kind of a substantial growth rate. Uh, but if you go back and look at the 13th, uh, the, the third plenum in 2013, uh, the, you know, they listed whatever it is, 60 some reforms that needed to be introduced. Uh, by my count, slightly over 30 would be related to making the market more efficient, which includes re legal reform and so on. Uh, and so, so, you know, the, if if China were to push hard on that, including reform, state enterprise, et cetera, uh, would, is that going to be uh, a major contributor to maintaining productivity? The other major problem in, uh, with the declining growth rate, other than the fact that it's China's reached a stage of growth where no one grows uh, at more than five five percent or so. Uh, the other problem is that China sustained growth for a long time by investing in two areas where there were huge shortages, housing and transport. Uh, that is now pretty much filled and therefore they can't do that. The question is, are there other areas where they could put that kind of investment, and we're talking about a huge investment. It's you know two 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 plus trillion dollars, two or three trillion dollars, U.S. Uh, if they put it into, could they put it into the environment? And then I'm going to come to Dale with a related question. Uh, you know, would environment actually help sustain growth, or are there, or is there so much of an environment that involves stopping coal production and so on that will keep uh, will not uh, lead to a sustained G GDP growth. The basic, uh, a more complete picture of what it will take to uh, sustain growth at let's say 5% uh, going forward, or if you don't like that, even four. Um, <clears throat> uh, first, I uh, also read the uh, 13th uh, plenum document with interest, and uh, I'm unlike you and most of the people here, I'm not a specialist on China, so I come to this with a relatively fresh view. What struck me about that document, uh, the backup document, the 60 proposals, is how vague some of them were. There was a remarkable range. Specificity, very precise, by 2020, the state-owned corporations would be paying 20% of their profits as dividends. Very obviously a decision had been made. And on the foreign exchange question, extraordinarily vague uh, thing. So, and my interpretation, but you will know better, of the vagueness of that document on many of the posts is there's no, dis there's no agreement. There's no agreement among the relevant officials, and so they're still debating them. And uh, it's worth reminding us that uh, nearly three years have gone by th since that document, and at least my, my rough count, they are way, way behind <laughs> in, in impl implementing. So I, um, uh, I consider it a hypothetical. <laughs> that, uh, hypothetical. One can imagine many things, uh, and one of the things one can imagine is that the uh, third plenum document will actually be carried out in full. Uh, no doubt some of them will be, and uh, uh, some of them will falter. Um, in terms of the environment, um, uh, what, what can I say? The OECD, actually maybe it was IEA, I'm not sure, uh, did a calculation for the rich countries as a whole in, uh, in the context of climate change um, and because uh, pollution is much less of an issue in the rich countries. And uh, they concluded that the negatives for the fossil fuels industry more or less offset the positives 
for the removal within what we, you know, we're dealing with trillions of dollars over several decades, so there's a margin of error there. Uh, and that the uh, big uh, uh, plus was conservation. And, but to take the orders of magnitude, I'm making this up now, but r roughly $30 billion of fossil fuel withdrawal of investment, for $30 billion of renewable investment plus, and then conservation, uh, uh, $8 billion. So uh, it's a net plus in terms of meeting the uh, objectives, the global objectives of climate change. Now, uh, China's pollution is much more severe, and the uh, scope, which we've seen it in London, we've seen it in Pittsburgh, we've seen it around the, in the last half century, in the rich countries, uh, the Chinese investment for uh, po possibilities for improving the environment are, and, and don't forget, not just air, it's water and soil. Water and soil are a big deal in China. Um, but, uh, and that's no doubt a benefit to humankind, but is it growth enhancing in the conventional way in which we measure it? Probably not. Okay, the question for Dale is, one, do you agree with that last statement that it's not growth enhancing? Obviously, it's social welfare enhancing, uh, both for the world and for, the, for China. And so one conclusion one could reach, one should abandon GDP targets and, 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 for, and focus more on so, some concept of social welfare. But do you buy the view that if I gave you a trillion dollars, uh, uh, you, the Chinese government, a uh, uh, trillion dollars, would you, w would, uh, or will carbon pricing solve all these problems, uh, or will, uh, will, will there be a use, for example, subsidies to f firms to accelerate the pace at which they would, uh, you know, you would then adjust the prices presumably to make them accelerate and then pour more money. If I gave you a trillion dollars, could you use it? Uh, I'm not going to try to tackle something quite that large, even though this is a discussion about China. Uh, and we should be uh, thinking big, obviously. Uh, but uh, I guess the answer is that um, I am really convinced that the uh, World Bank report uh, done in collaboration with the Development Research Center, China 2030, uh, is a pretty good guide to uh, what Chinese economic growth is going to look like. Uh, and this is now almost five years old, so uh, we've uh, got uh, years of experience now behind this, uh, is a good guide. And it doesn't suggest a dramatic uh, speed of the slowdown, but it definitely involves uh, ratcheting down uh, the growth rate. There's a, an element here that uh, hasn't been uh, the focus of a lot of attention in this uh, debate yet, which is the idea that China did achieve some other great distinction, which is that uh, they sustained for a period of time a uh, saving rate, uh, an investment rate, that uh, turned out to be close to 50%. That hasn't decreased uh, all that much uh, so far. And so there's uh, plenty of resources for the factor accumulation part of the uh, growth that uh, we heard from uh, Ed about uh, as an alternative to uh, innovation. So I think that uh, what we're going to see uh, is the kind of slowdown that will be gradual, uh, appropriate to the fact that there's no longer going to be an increase in the saving rate and an increase in the investment rate. That's what drove this double-digit uh, growth for such an extended period of time, as well as the great opportunities that uh, Dick uh, Cooper laid out. So I don't see that as a pessimistic outcome. Uh, the important thing is there are plenty of great things for China yet to achieve. Uh, for example, uh, the second World Bank report in this series with the Development Research Center dealt with urbanization. I don't agree with uh, what your question seems to suggest, White, which is that urbanization is over. I think there is plenty of opportunity. Look at uh, Japan, for example, and uh, how the uh, rural population has uh, practically disappeared. You could probably uh, staff uh, Japanese agriculture with, uh, you know, 40,000 people. There's still more people there, but they're at retirement age and are going to uh, retire and uh, essentially fade away. And 
That is not what's going to happen immediately in China, but there's going to be still huge opportunities for urbanization, and uh, that's reflected in the uh, current asset price boom in some of the major Chinese cities. Uh, all of these things support the basic thesis of China 2030, which is that once the investment rate stabilizes, then the growth rate inevitably begins to ratchet down. That's exactly what has happened. And I don't extrapolate that to zero. I extrapolate that to the course that is followed in China 2030, which gets us down to uh, the range of maybe 5% by uh, 2030. So I think that's a, a pessim uh, an optimistic outlook uh, about China, and uh, yet a very realistic outlook. Well, as to whether, and this is uh, Dwight's direct question, uh, the environment itself provides a source of investment opportunities that could keep this investment boom going. Uh, well, uh, it's important to do that efficiently, and uh, it's important to stimulate that investment with uh, appropriate pricing incentives, and that's why the Chinese, following this uh, di uh, dictum that uh, came out of the uh, uh, 18th uh, plenum, uh, has followed the uh, formula so carefully uh, for pricing carbon. That will bring it back into the GDP, of course, and so we'll be able to see what's uh, going on, and people will begin to make the rational choices that they need to, to do the kind of environmental cleanup that China needs. Now, whether that's going to be a trillion dollars or $10 trillion over a, a more extended period of time, I don't know. Uh, but it can't be cheap. Uh, it's something that involves transforming the whole society. Uh, can I say one? Since uh, uh, Dale talked about carbon taxes, I just want to register my view of extreme skepticism about the camp and trade cap and trade system in China. It's a set up for corruption. They've been very uh, non-transparent about how the permits had been uh, allocated and so forth. But Dale's proposal is for the other 50% carbon taxes. And when it comes to growth, the use of the revenue of carbon taxes is extremely important. And one can imagine using those for growth inducing purposes or for the PLA or whatever, you know. Uh, but anyway, it's a very important point. If you have carbon taxes, you have revenue, and the use of the revenues is very important for uh, growth strategy. I just want to leave that point. Yeah, the problem is because the savings rate is so high and because it's going to stay high for quite a, some time, uh, you, a very large part of that investment is going to end up being done by the government. Right. And the question is, and right now the rate of return on that investment very is coming down very sharply. Anyway, okay, so open up. Yeah, we, Is there a mic anyway? We have a mic coming. Right. I'm Gwendolyn Stewart, and my question follows up on a couple of what, things you've been saying. But one is about agriculture. I mean, the discussion seems to be always agriculture is useful for getting people out of it and into the cities. What is the real state of ownership, rights use, whatever, of the land in China? And what productivity might come out of doing something different with the land? More productivity in agriculture. And it's a small thing with all this wonderful improvement in rice. Why are we getting all these reports about arsenic in rice? It doesn't sound like a quality addition. Um, but that may have nothing to do with China, but it's just been an alarming thing. But really, the agriculture, both for the people who still do it and who, who does own, the, are there clear land rights? for anybody other than government, municipality, something, and what can we get out of agriculture to increase productivity, not just moving any, everybody into the cities? Thank you. Ed, do you want to? Well, I don't know. Uh, let, let, let me uh, try this out and then uh, let Ed uh, chime in on the innovation aspects of things. I think that uh, making agriculture more efficient using a price system is precisely what the Chinese have in mind. And that's precisely what will move all these people out uh, into the cities. And therefore, the number of people that will be involved in Chinese agriculture will decline. Okay. Dick Cooper mentioned the fact that there's also a water problem, not only the issue related to the environment, but simply the supply of water, agricultural water, drinking water, et cetera, uh, to the cities. And there are uh, great prospects uh, for some very expensive, hopefully efficient investments uh, in the water system that will be related to the power supply and will provide non-carbon-based uh, 
supplies along with the supply of water. So China has uh, traditionally had a, a society that uh, uh, devotes great attention, uh, and rightly so, to agriculture and to these water issues and now to the environment and to power. And uh, so agriculture certainly deserves the kind of attention that you're suggested, then uh, your question suggests. Uh, Ed, you probably have some things to say about uh, agricultural technology. I'll just say very briefly, I don't think anybody's suggesting that food production should stop. It's an issue of how to make food production more efficient and also more safe for the consumers. So we are seeing in, in China, as in other places, but definitely seeing in China, very rapid mechanization of agriculture. Lots of movement of not just equipment, but as I said, uh, data intensive solutions. So that rice sorter I mentioned isn't just used for rice, it's used for corn because it can identify mycotoxins. And they're now, like, as in many countries in China, there are food regulations that allow only a certain level, a small level of toxins, mycotoxins on corn. And so when you have a combination of physical equipment and sensing and the ability to do something with the data, you can have outcomes that are that create some commercial value and that are better for the consumer. I, I'll add that uh, the issue of arsenic and other heavy metals in food is a, is, a, is a big concern everywhere, including in China. And again, we see, I don't know, I don't mean to sound Pollyanna-ish, but there is some kind of convergence between regulation and commercial providers of technology, not just the the capital equipment, but the cloud services, the data analytics, who want to do something about heavy metals. And arsenic is something that exactly the same company as I'm talking about, it's very high on the agenda. Okay. Okay. Any other, anybody else have any questions? Yes, well, up uh, top there. I'm Paul Rapp um, from Clark University in Worcester and a Fairbank associate. Um, I have a question about the relationship between the politics and, and the economy. And this relates to David Shambaugh's recent book, uh, The Future of China, or China's Future, where he argues the major constraint, in addition to the six that Professor Cooper laid out, on China's growth is the closed and authoritarian political system. And um, I'm not an economist or a political scientist, I'm a historian, but it seems to me that that kind of argument has been going on for 35 years, that uh, China can't continue to grow unless it liberalizes its economy. And uh, my guess is the leaders in, in Beijing won't buy that argument because they've, they've done pretty well. well. I'm curious what the panel thinks about that. Do you want to take that? Um, I'm a amateur political scientists and uh, look at the literature superficially to be sure and I followed this debate over the years and there's just been, and as you can imagine it's been a two-sided debate uh, I don't know who's going to come out uh, ahead and I don't know when it's going to be revealed when it will a century from now half a century from now a decade from now but so far the Chinese have managed to with their economy with supreme skill. And uh, some of that is official stuff, and that some of that is tolerated illegal, as uh, <laughs> Sandra called it, uh, illegal stuff, but it's tolerated as, as long as it keeps things going. And so I would not be put my bets on if, if, and I think it's really important to put a time horizon on all such bets, but if you're talking about the next decade, I would not be put my bets on a, a serious change in the Chinese system. Uh, maybe in 50 years, uh, right. There is no doubt that the political system acts in some areas and it, as an inhibition on growth. But you know, all political systems do that. Look at the United States in the recent years. We, we, we still deny climate change, uh, the Senate does, uh, and uh, you use the term ratified. We, this is an executive agreement by the U.S., not ratified, oh, the Senate Paris right. Agreement, and the next president could over, overturn it. And, uh, well, we won't go into the U.S. India is another example. India is a, a, a de uh, an imperfect, but nonetheless a democracy. India is doing quite well at the moment, 
but compared with China over the last 30 years is far inferior to what's happened in China. So I think these uh, uh, correlations are not tight ones between the political system and the, what we, what we know for sure is that really terrible authoritarian system really damage the economy. We have lots and lots of examples of that, but uh, an intelligent authoritarian system may work. I'd like to make a comment about liberalization. I think that you're quite right that uh, there is uh, a lot of opportunity for liberalization. And uh, the uh, Xi Jinping re uh, regime uh, represents an effort to escape from essentially a decade of uh, no, uh, relatively little uh, liberalization on the uh, uh, model of earlier regimes. So I think that uh, the fact is that uh, China is uh, kind of uh, at a point where a lot of liberalization like that contemplated in this uh, 2013 document uh, would have an enormous economic payoff. Uh, but that's not something that uh, can be quantified like the GDP uh, or uh, the growth rate or uh, something like that. It's a much more uh, difficult issue as you uh, suggest. So I think that uh, we should look for opportunities here, and I'm sure the Chinese are doing the same thing. Pricing of carbon is precisely a step toward liberalization as opposed to a more direct control. But Dick uh, Cooper is right that uh, the way that they've chosen to do this as an alternative to the carbon tax, which could have been applied across the board, involves bureaucrats handing out uh, permits to producing units. And you just heard from Ed stories about what can happen in a setting like that. And uh, they don't all lead you to the conclusion that this is going to happen uh, in the most efficient way that will uh, be focused on economic objectives. Can I just say something very quickly? Uh, I am a professional political scientist, not that that's worth a whole lot necessarily, but I, and I, I firmly believe that there is a relationship between economic behavior and socio-political institutions, but I also believe we don't yet really understand that relationship for China or maybe even for the advanced U.S. and Europe as well. And I say that because I could comfortably and honestly provide a narrative about how development in the U.S. had to do with clear property rights and spreading of markets and, and, and liberalization, I'd be comfortable doing that. But I could also tell a story about development happening in the context of slavery and suppression of lots of groups of people, women, others. And what that really says about the exact relationship between different constellations of institutions and economic performance, it's awfully hard to say. And add on to that, a big government and big government involvement in defense investments and war fighting and everything else. And so I would just say that the crude connections between big labels like democracy or authoritarianism and economic outcomes, I'm very skeptical about, the, the questioner didn't do this, but skeptical about the crude labels and would be much more inclined to think in a more maybe nuanced way about exactly what kinds of institutions relate to economic outcomes and how. Just to add, just uh, there's actually a considerable literature in development economics and on on this issue of uh, whether uh, there is a some kind of relationship between authoritarian regimes and or and more open and more liberal regimes uh, and and economic growth uh, and. My own reading of much of that literature is, is that it's inconclusive when you try to do statistical analysis. It comes, it comes out depending on where you want it to come out. Uh, but there's a very influential book by Asamoglu and Robinson that uh, Why Countries Fail that tries to make the case that, that it is actually the lack of of uh, particip participation of the population in the in the governance and in some broader sense that is central to growth over the sustained growth over the long term, uh, but the, in my own opinion, the China chapter of that uh, is the weakest part of that whole book. But uh, anyway, uh, we have now reached uh, 315, and I think somebody else probably is going to, or there's going to be a panel somewhere else starting now. So thank you all very much. Uh, uh,